So welcome to a walk in the park with Animal Friends. Today, you can see we are not in our usual studio, but we are very excitingly on site at the Hawk Conservancy Trust. We have Tom with us today. Tom, do you want to just intro yourself and what you do here at Hawk Conservancy Trust? Yeah, my name is Tom Morath. I am the Deputy Head of Living Collection here at the Hawk Conservancy Trust and essentially have the best job in the world, really looking after about 120 or so different birds of prey from all around the world mm -hmm. and showcasing them as part of our visitor center here, um, which are kind of the uh, the front shop, I suppose, of, of the conservation and research projects that we do. So yeah, it, it's an incredible place to be. Amazing, and I love coming here. Do you wanna tell our listeners whereabouts are we right now? Yeah, we are in, well, we're near Andover mm -hmm. in Hampshire um, in the UK uh, on, beautiful, beautiful bit of land that we've got here overlooking the East Chalderton Valley. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lovely part of the countryside. So Tom, just digging into a bit more about you, how did you end up here at the Hawk Conservancy Trust? Yeah, well, sort of by luck and sort of by judgment, really. I visited here for the first time when I was, I think, 14 or 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And from the moment I stepped through the doors, I knew that this is where I wanted to be. Even at that point, I was lucky enough to be working with Birds of Prey uh, sort of part-time and sort of before that as a volunteer. So I've sort of got a long history of working alongside Birds of Prey. But I think the very beginning, the sort of seed for me was both my parents and my grandparents really were keen advocates of young people getting outside. That yeah. you weren't just at home on the computer game. You weren't just watching the television. You were getting out in the countryside. And uh, we would spot wild buzzards, mm -hmm. wild kites and kestrels. And if we were really lucky of an evening when we were driving home, we'd see a barn owl. And, and seeing those things just kind of sparked that interest initially for me. And then I knew I wanted to somehow make that a career and I never yeah. thought I'd be sat here talking to you about yeah. it now. It's a dream come true, really. Oh, that sounds amazing. So can you tell me a little bit more about the Hawk Conservancy Trust? When was it established? Why was it established? Yeah, we've been here for over 50 years now mm -hmm. and are a specialist uh, bird of prey charity. So we exist really to fulfill our chari charitable mission, which mm -hmm. is the conservation of birds of prey, which sounds super simple, but of course there are Never so is. many different complex tasks mm -hmm. that need to be completed yeah. to achieve that mission um, and with a wide range of different species. Um, but I suppose the, the organization is twofold in that sense, that there's conservation and research that goes on, rehabilitation, and also the work that we're doing on site with our living collection. So the birds that are part of uh, the, the visitor attraction that are here. So we fly upwards of 80 birds of prey in our daily flying displays mm -hmm. that people can come and, and watch. You can get really close to some of the most impressive birds of prey in the world. Some birds will be soaring hundreds of feet up in the sky. Some of the owls that we fly will come and sit right by you and you can be just a few inches away from an owl. Yep. Um, so it's really about that wow factor. But all of that is to try to get over this message of one, how incredible the animal kingdom is, and especially of course, birds of prey, we're very biased on that. Yep. Um, but also just how much help and support is needed to, to allow these birds to continue to thrive in the wild because there are several species that are in dire need of our, our support. Yeah, which we will absolutely dig into a little bit later sure. in this episode. But have you always been on this site? Yes, yeah, yeah, we have. I mean, we, we, over the years, there's been uh, other locations where we've often some uh, consultancy and we've flown birds at other locations. So personally, I was very lucky to work at uh, up in the Lake District National Park. Oh, nice. The Hawk Conservancy Trust were helping to establish a bird of prey center there. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful location up at a castle, overlooking a beautiful vista there. And uh, that's really my beginnings of working professionally with the Hawk Conservancy Trust. So um, certainly we've become quite famous for the flying displays that we do. And lots of people would love to try to replicate what we do, I think. But, you know, really home right here on, on the ground here is, you just you just cannot see anything quite like what we do here anywhere yeah. else. No, absolutely. And I can absolutely confirm that I've been uh, here so many times with my family and everyone that I've brought here are just so impressed with the displays and, and actually what you learn here because there's a huge amount of education that happens mm. in all of your displays actually, which um, again, we'll dig into a little bit later because that's vital to, to what you're doing here is the education piece. Of course, yeah. And it's changing all the time. So, you know, we hope that when visitors come to see us, they're learning something new each time because mm. we certainly are. You know, everything yeah. that we're doing 
is based in the science that's kind of happening behind the scenes. And we're trying to present that to people who are coming to see us. So yeah, we're, we're learning something new. There's always something new to be able to tell everybody about these incredible birds. Um, and that's part of the joy of it, really. No two days are ever the same. Yeah, I can imagine that, actually, especially working with animals. That, yeah, you, you can't ever predict what they're going to do. No, you cannot. <laughs> so from a bird of prey uh, perspective, and I know this will vary amongst the, the wide variety of species that you have here, but why are birds of prey so important? Well, birds of prey on the whole are apex predators. So they sit right at the top of that food chain, mm. which makes them fantastic indicators of how healthy the rest of the ecosystem is doing. So we, we look to those birds to give us an indication of how healthy an ecosystem is, how well the other creatures that are living within that ecosystem are doing. So they're, they're really good on that, that front. And like all predators, they're there to kind of maintain the the levels of biodiversity mm -hmm. so that no one species begins to kind of take over an environment um, and, and catching those and eating those those animals as a, as a predator. Yeah. And I suppose when you start talking about birds of prey, I always kind of conjure up images of being in Africa or somewhere yeah. like that. But, you know, birds of prey are hugely important in the UK as well. Yeah, we've got some fabulous wildlife here in the UK. I'm, and I'm a great advocate for telling people that, mm. you know, as you've just said, you always think of going on safari to Africa or, you know, going to, to the, the Amazon rainforest to see these incredible creatures. But actually, there's so much amazing wildlife right outside our back door and birds of prey are very much a part of that. Um, you know, like I mentioned to you before, I, as a child, loved going out and seeing yeah. wild animals and especially wild birds of prey. And I'm sure many of your listeners will have seen birds of prey in the wild. And if you've had a moment like seeing a barn owl quartering over an open meadow on a summer's evening. I mean, there yeah. really isn't anything more just, special than that. Just for uh, listeners, explain what quartering is. Yeah, sorry. Quartering <laughs> is uh, most owls are what we call perch and pounce predators. Yeah. So they'll sit up in a tree as still as they possibly can and, and wait for a poor unsuspecting rodent usually yeah. to come wandering underneath them and then they pounce down and catch them. Barn owls are a little bit different in that they are adapted to sweep over huge vast areas, mm -hmm. usually over open meadows, large fields, and they will do something called quartering, which is yep. flying the four corners of the field backwards and forwards. So they're scanning the entirety of that area in order to listen for the scurry of a mouse or a vole. So yep. it means we get to see more flying from a barn owl if you see them in the wild. Yep. And that's probably why if you're going to see an owl, an owl in the UK, it's going to be a barn owl because they're just simply more active. Yeah. So probably the hardest question of this episode is going to be... <laughs> Which is your favourite oh, no. bird of prey? <laughs> is it like trying to choose a favourite child? Oh, it is. It really is. I mean, I'm a little bit biased myself because there's obviously a few individuals that we as members of the bird team get to build up a particularly special bond and relationship with. So as I mentioned, we've got a collection here of over 100 birds and all of them are special to us. But each of the members of the team here, which yeah. there are about 15 of us that work directly with the birds we establish working relationship with a select group of those birds, yeah. build up that close working bond before they're then free flown in our displays. Um, so one such bird for me is a bird called Sage. Yeah. She is a tawny owl mm. and uh, she's 12 years old this year and I've known her since she was 10 days old. Oh, amazing. So she's like my baby. Yeah. She lived in, in my house for a little while when she was a, a small chick before yeah. she could fly. Um, so yeah, although um, many people might not consider the tawny owl to be the most impressive bird that we work with here, she's very, very special to me. But then, you know, I'm also the kind of key person working with a bird called Arthur. He is a, a white-headed vulture. Yeah. And uh, if you're not, if you're unsure what a white-headed vulture looks like, obviously it kind of does what it says on the tin, <laughs> but it's beautiful white yeah. plume of feathers on the top of their head. They're kind of jet black and white, um, and they've got this beautifully kind of red and purpley colored beak yeah. and, and a blue sear, that little bit of skin above their beak. So really colorful for a vulture, but they're also uh, quite eagle-like. They're sometimes nicknamed the eagle vulture for this mm -hmm. reason, because they can go and kind of catch and kill their own food. And they're very large. Like yeah. he's got about a two meter wingspan wow. and he soars over the meadow and but he's a really nice guy. Like yeah. he's just, he looks like this big imposing animal. Actually, he's one of the most sweet natured birds I've ever had the chance to work oh. with. So yeah, we do end up having favorites, but we, we, we try not to tell people that. <laughs> so on the flip side, is there one bird that's just like, I don't like Tom? Uh, don't you know, there aren't many. I'm very grateful <laughs> that I've not managed to get in anybody's bad books, really. Um, you, as you kind of build your experience, you tend to 
get to know the bird's body language really well yeah. and to try to sort of um, uh, subvert those uh, those sort of feelings from the bird quite quickly. Yeah. And, and your, your key... Um, support really in working with our birds is to stay in their good books yeah. you know so we're free flying birds daily they've got to want to be around you of and course. so it's a big part of our role to try and make sure they're as happy and comfortable as possible so as it stands at the moment i can s gladly say there are no eagles with a vendetta against me <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good hopefully we'll keep it that way as yeah. well Tom. so i know you said no two days are the same but just for listeners to give them an idea if there's a budding person out there who goes i'd love tom's job yeah what what does that really look like yeah i'm sure there are many because yeah. like certainly from an outward perspective it is the best job in the world yeah. and it certainly feels that way um but from a working on the bird team perspective it is making sure the the, the flying team and the, the bird team that live here are uh, fit healthy and happy that's our primary reason for being here is to ensure their health yeah. uh, both mentally and physically and to to make sure they're as kind of comfortable as they can be whilst they're they're here with us um, so the day kind of starts with a check of the whole team. Mm -hmm. So between us, we'll spread out across the grounds. We've each got an area of the park to, to check in with, make sure the structures of the aviaries are sound, yeah. make sure the birds are bright eyed and bushy tailed and to kind of have that early alert system that we think if anybody's looking a bit unwell, mm. if we've got breeding birds here, whether we think an egg's sort of imminently going to hatch. Yeah. So we've got a really good finger on the pulse of, of what's happening all across the park and that everybody is is fit healthy and happy yeah uh, and then it's time to get ready for visitors to come and join us so we yeah. have a, about two hours in the morning where the park is quiet we can just concentrate on the health and well-being of the team yeah. and then when visitors come in we're also looking after those visitors for the day as well and making sure people have a fantastic day out yeah. which is of course seeing the birds fly so we prepare the food for the birds to fly for for the day yeah. we make sure all the birds are, are ready for the the flying displays and uh, and that's really the best bit of the job is is flying the birds free, getting the birds to see, getting the birds to show those natural and instinctive behaviours, yeah. taking off, and then ultimately coming back, which is sort of part of the magic of what we do is we've built up this relationship yeah. and then they fly back to us and visitors can share in that magic really. Yeah, and and you're right, the, the perfect word to explain it is magical to mm. see that happening and see it up close and just be in it because a lot of the displays are very kind of interactive. I mean, I've had a an owl fly right over the top of my head. I could yeah. feel the, the air skim my hair. It was amazing. But yeah, it just must be so magical to do that every day. Yeah. But you do have another job here as well, Tom. Yeah. So you run your own podcast. Yeah, I do. Do you want to tell listeners a bit about your podcast? Yeah, it's called Nature's a Hoot. Yes. So you see what we did there. Um, <laughs> but the important thing of the work that we do at the Trust is that we understand that, yes, birds of prey are our focus, but also that birds of prey don't live alone. You know, they're, they're a part of a wider ecosystem. So mm. the idea of the podcast was for us to be able to take a bit of a deeper dive into the world of birds of prey yeah. and go a little bit more in depth into some of the problems that they're facing in the wild, some of the things that are very species specific so we can really focus on a species. And then a few of the other episodes are talking a little bit more broadly about how those birds of prey fit into their ecosystems and the other problems that other creatures might be facing. So um, in 2020, when we're all at home and couldn't go anywhere or do anything, yeah. it was uh, sort of the brainchild of myself and a, a few of my colleagues really to put the podcast together yeah. so that we, we can actually talk to people all around the world through the podcast, which is incredible. You know, yeah. we've got listeners in the US, we've got listeners in South Africa yeah. and these people that are likely never to visit the trust but our message of, of the conservation of birds of prey is reaching them. So that, yes. that's the main goal of it really is to, to talk to people that may otherwise not, not come to see us. Yeah. And I am sure from today's episode, people are going to be inspired about birds of prey. So where can they go and get your podcast? Yeah. And, well, anywhere people get their podcasts. Yeah. So um, yeah, through Apple Podcasts, through Spotify, through all of these different different methods or through our website as well. We've got a link straight straight to there. So yeah, main homepage and, and things to do. And you can go and have a listen to Nature's a Hoot. Amazing. So Tom, we've talked about all the great things about the job that you do. What do you find most challenging? Well, that's a difficult question. I think uh, the challenges come with the fact that we work essentially with living creatures. So 
obviously these are, are birds that have their own thoughts and feelings and <laughs> therefore you know sometimes that that can be a challenge is to try and get into the mindset of the birds that we're working with um so that that's certainly challenging um also sometimes it's challenging to con to continue putting forward uh, the messages that we have about conservation when they kind of seem so bleak mm -hmm. you know we're working with some of the most threatened species in the world yeah. and we we work with those birds one to one members of those species yeah so to hear bad news from those who are working on the front line about poisoning incidents with vultures yeah is uh, is pretty pretty hard to kind of put into perspective and then to kind of continue trying to be upbeat about. I think sometimes yeah. that that's one of the most challenging things is to is to not let that dull the the passion for wanting to make a difference because sometimes yeah. it does it does feel deflating. But yeah. that's that is the 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 mission of conservation, isn't it? That you're kind of you're pushing against the tide sometimes. Yeah, and the challenge is because you don't have that degree of separation because you're working with them every day. Yeah, you're so yeah. invested in it. Yeah, I I couldn't even imagine. But um, we'll we'll pick up a little bit later more about the vultures because I do want to really dig into that bit sure. from a conservation perspective. <laughs> So we're really lucky to be here at the Hawk Conservancy Trust and one of the key birds that you do a huge amount of work here with is vultures. So Animal Friends have recently done a campaign, it's an awareness campaign about ugly endangered animals. Obviously to me and to you I'm sure vultures are definitely not ugly because it's ugly but they don't always have the spotlight that they should have they're uh, amazing birds that do so much for our ecosystem but tom you're absolutely the expert here so do you want to tell us a little bit more about what types of vultures do we have yeah well i wouldn't necessarily say i'm an expert but i'm certainly a big fan and yeah. that goes a long way doesn't it you're absolutely right that they don't tend to get a huge amount of very uh, a very good press but um the vulture species that we focus on largely from our living collection side of things are lots of the African species of vultures mm -hmm. and those are some of the species that need our help the most uh, and also we've got projects working with uh, Asia's vultures as well to uh, or many species of vultures within those two areas of the world yeah. that have experienced huge declines over the last 20 to 30 years. Yeah. So you just talked about um, geographical um, vultures there. There's two types of vultures, right? There are. Well, there's yeah. two There's two sort of subgroups of vultures, if yeah. you like. So there's what we call the old world vultures. Mm -hmm. So all those species that live in Europe, Africa and Asia. And then there's the new world vultures from the new world, from the Americas. Yeah. And they're sort of distinct from each other. They look quite quite different so many of the old world vultures look like what I would kind of call the classic jungle book vulture yep. that kind of long yep. neck and they've got a big bill um, whereas the new world vultures are things like uh, turkey vultures so called because at a distance they look a bit like a turkey yep. I suppose um, and also uh, things like the condors so quite famously largest flying birds of prey in the world mm. so huge huge wingspans and huge weights to get in the air so yeah two distinct groups of vultures. So from a vulture perspective there are some vultures I understand that are critically endangered can you mm. tell us a bit more about what is really Really affecting them. So the big threat really for Asia's vultures historically has been uh, the use of a veterinary drug mm -hmm. called uh, diclofenac or diclofenac. Mm -hmm. It's uh, an anti-inflammatory ingredient used to treat lameness in cattle. Okay. And in a part of the world where cattle and uh, cows are very often very sacred, mm -hmm. historically the way that they have been uh, removed from the environment has been to leave them out for the vultures to eat. It's kind of that big cir circle mm -hmm. of life. Vultures are fantastic scavengers. Yep. They're very, very efficient. Um, so it's one of the safest and most eco-friendly ways really that we can dispose of a large carcass like that was to leave it out for vultures. Yep. As we've got better at treating our livestock and using some of these drugs, unbeknownst to us, that has a knock-on effect that's been negative for vultures. Mm -hmm. So it's poisonous to vultures, diclofenac. They have come down to feed on those carcasses and died as a result. Um, thankfully today, as a result of campaigners and conservation organisations like ourselves, we're starting to see a bit of a turn in the winds really for Asia's vultures. They're doing a little better in the wild. We established uh, uh, breeding centres for uh, Asian white bat vultures, mm -hmm. which are a species that underwent a huge decline, as much as 98% of their population completely wiped out. Mm -hmm. So millions upon millions of birds just disappearing as a direct result of the use of this drug. Um, uh, 
and uh, also of course the banning of that drug, uh, drug across much of Asia yeah. um, and now a kind of a vulture safe variety of, uh, of that drug is, is now being used widely. Um, the other threat that we focus, focus on a lot is the, the African vulture crisis as it's now sort of known as. Uh, vultures are treated as a direct enemy of poachers wanting to try to shoot elephants and remove their tusks. So everybody knows about the ivory trade. It's like yeah. what I describe as like the big bad wolf of wildlife crime, yeah. but it has a wider impact on animals other than elephants. So if you're a poacher, you want to try to shoot an elephant to remove that tusk, it takes a long time to remove that tusk. And what you've done as the poacher is created a fabulous feeding opportunity for the vultures. Yes. Now, if you're a game guard trying to catch people red-handed in the act of, of uh, killing an elephant, one of the best things you can do is to look for other wildlife activity. How is the rest of the ecosystem reacting to this event? And one, one thing that will happen is scavengers will start to, start to move in, yeah. and vultures are some of the first to do that. So huge numbers of vultures start circling above that carcass. The game guards spot them and travel towards that carcass. And yeah. of course, sometimes we'll catch those poachers red-handed. And if you're a poacher, that's the last thing you want. You're committing a criminal offence. And so the poachers treat vultures as a direct enemy and will lace carcasses with poison in order to prevent that from happening. Oh. Um, so although the ivory trade is, is dreadful and wrong in and of itself, I think few people realise just how far the repercussions go. And certainly from our point of view, the vultures are kind of top of that list to try to protect. So, so just so that I'm understanding, the listeners can understand by lacing the carcass with poison. How many vultures can that essentially potentially decimate it, it, in it, one carcass? It can be dozens. Yeah. In some cases, it's been hundreds of birds. Vultures feed in great numbers, and that's part of the the wonder of vultures and how good they are at scavenging yeah. is they come in huge numbers, and therefore that carcass doesn't sit around for very long. I think we've got a misconception that vultures eat uh, rotting and decaying food, but actually they're so efficient that they arrive so quickly. Yeah. It's actually pretty fresh whilst they're eating it, and lots of those birds feeding remove it from the environment very quickly. That's part of the reason they're so valuable to the other animals and other creatures that live around them. Unfortunately, that means that when we have one of these incidents, huge numbers of vultures come down to feed. And it's not just vultures, all sorts of other scavengers come along, mm. you know, and uh, we, we've had some of the, the guys that work on the field come back from seeing a poisoning incident like this and tell us, yes, there's dead vultures around the carcass, but there might be a, a dead hyena or a dead lion over on, under, under a bush somewhere, yeah. you know, it might be a, a back eagle or a tawny eagle up in a tree gasping its last breaths because they're fed from this in, in just dreadful dreadfully poisoned animal so um, yeah it's a, it has big repercussions and for a group of birds or a species certainly things like African white bat vultures white-headed vultures hooded vultures three species that we highlight during our displays here at yeah. the trust they're all critically endangered so when an uh, uh, poisoning incident like that takes place you're wiping out a big percentage of a very small number of birds that are left on our planet as they are critically endangered one step away from being extinct in the wild course. So how do you even begin to tackle something like that? It's really really difficult yeah. obviously a lot of the areas that vultures will live in are vast yeah. so unlike with other animals where we might try to protect them by establishing a national park let's say or a game reserve and sort of fence them into a safe area yeah. of course you can't do that with vultures because they traverse hundreds of miles in some cases um, but the big thing that we've developed is something called a poison response kit. Our, our poison response action campaign essentially has everything included in, in a rucksack to yeah. deal with a poisoning incident as our personnel on the ground approach approach a poisoning incident. Yeah. So that's both keeping those personnel safe because what's poisonous to a vulture and those other animals is bound to be poisonous and very deadly and toxic to those people too, so yeah. PPE for them. Also gathering any evidence that they can find in the surrounding area and most importantly I suppose for the vultures clearing up that carcass, removing it from the ecosystem so that there may already be dead vultures there but no further animals are going to be casualties of that, that incident. Yeah. And you touched on the ecosystem there, because um, I, I love the way that uh, vultures are described here. They're nature's cleanup crew. Yeah. But they play such a vital role in ecosystems. Can you talk to us a little bit more about what they do? Yeah, well, they eat vast amounts of dead meat. Yeah. Um, and, and scavengers in an ecosystem are arguably just as important as the those top of the food chain predators. They remove that dead animal. Mm -hmm 
and that is the natural natural way of wild is disposing of its dead you know yeah. and when that doesn't happen that's when problems are, are likely to start to arise we're not 100 percent sure what those problems will be but we know that it can't be good yeah and uh, am I right in thinking that they've got some almost like superpowers around their stomach acid and the types of things that it can digest? Yeah, very powerful stomach acid. And of course, they're, um, the positive for them is that they are birds, of course, so they may not be susceptible to the same infections and diseases mm -hmm. that mammals might be. But yeah, there are reports that they can feed on animals with uh, typhoid, anthrax, all these different things that would be deadly and horrendous for us, mm. but actually they can eat those things and, and survive to tell the tale. Very powerful stomach acids and don't mind getting into the dirty spaces yeah. to access that food, which of Absolutely. course is all, all down to that adaptation they've got. Yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons why we wanted to cover them as part of the ugly endangered, because mostly people see them, like, as you said, like picture them eating rotten carcasses, but that's not the case. Yeah. They're so hugely, vitally important to things like that. And it's not just about keeping other animals safe. They help to keep... Um, illnesses down for the population so that they don't spread into humans as well. Yeah, right? so one of the things that happened in Asia when there was a decrease in the number of vultures, you know, the, the ecosystem and the, the human population had lived side by side with vultures for many hundreds, thousands of years. When vultures start to decline, there's that old expression that nature abhors a vacuum. So as soon as a creature is missing from an ecosystem, mm. something else will come in to fill its place. Yeah. Something is going to eat that dead food instead. And what has often been found is that uh, larger mammalian scavengers will come in and they obviously pose a larger threat to us potentially because mm -hmm. they're more readily able to pass on diseases. So yeah. things like feral dogs in towns and cities starting to eat dead things, yeah. coming in and biting human beings mm. is going to potentially spread those diseases more quickly so yeah vultures are vital for us too yeah so i'm really privileged today to be able to meet one of the vultures yes. so are we gonna get who did you say was coming in uh, his name is sundance, sundance yeah he's okay. one of the stars of our shows here so i'm just going to give the guys a shout yeah yeah no and, worries um, see whether we can ask him to come and join us hello hugo would you mind letting sundance out for us so just while we wait for sundance to fly in what would be the impact if vultures became extinct in the future, do you think? Yeah, it's, it's difficult to tell. Yeah. I mean, they, do, they, they play such a vital role to all of the other animals around them. But of course, there could potentially be this huge build-up of rotting food, which mm. is not good. Um, and again, we might see that balance shift towards other creatures that potentially we wouldn't necessarily want to see skyrocket in numbers as are described in Asia where you know feral dogs have, uh, were on the rise yeah. and causing problems problems to us. The other key thing to, to note is that as they are this what we call as a, a, I know as a keystone species they sort of hold everything else together they're also a really good indicator of how healthy the rest of the ecosystem is yeah. and so oh here he is <laughs> and so <laughs> when you lose that um, suddenly it's very difficult to tell how everything else is doing, yeah. how healthy the rest of the ecosystem is. Do you want to come up here? Got a little bit of food for you if you want it. Here it comes. Ah. So Tom, is Sundance's face always this colour? It's not actually. Yeah. It changes colour depending on how he's feeling. Yeah. So when he's sort of in his aviary, he's finished for the day, there's not a huge amount going on. Mm -hmm. His face is actually a similar colour that you can see to his legs and his yes. feet here, like a pale greyish sort of a colour. Yep. When he comes out here, he feels excited. Mm -hmm. He's coming out, he's flying, he's joining in the fun with us, he's yep. getting used to us. He's also, as you can see, getting a tasty tidbit of food there. Yeah. And so he feels excited and he blushes his face bright pink. And we think this is a way they might communicate with each other in the wild. So rather than alerting other predators in the area to the fact that they're there, they yeah. might blush to tell other vultures, oh, actually, there's a feeding opportunity just okay. over there. Let's go, and in, let's go and check it out. But vultures also don't have a call in the same way lots of other larger birds of prey do or other birds of prey do. Um, and so they, they don't make an awful lot of sound. They make little grunts and squeaks, yeah. but nothing that's going to carry too far. But a vulture's eyesight's very good, so spotting that glowing pink face, which yeah. is just gorgeous, isn't it? Yeah, and, and, you know, this is up close and personal, you can see. Definitely. They're definitely not ugly. They are absolutely beautiful. And they're beautiful in their own way. I mean, yeah. I think you have to understand what an animal's role is yep. in an environment to really understand its beauty. Yes. And for a vulture, 
they're the ultimate scavenger. Yeah. So if you kind of picture a vulture's the best day of their working week yeah. for a bird like Sundance here, ooh, <laughs> is, <laughs> I thought he wasn't going to cry and la get that landing quite right there. Uh, but the best day of a, a vulture like Sundance's working week is when their head is at the wrong end of a dead zebra. Yep. Let's say that to be polite. Yep. If that was your day job, you, I'm sure you'll be with me on this, surely you don't want beautiful long locks of flowing blonde hair. No. Because it is going to go wrong really quickly. Yeah. And, and another misconception of vultures is that they're dirty. Yeah. Actually, having that adaptation proves that it's the other way around. Mm. Everything about them is to stay clean. Very few feathers on the top of their head makes it much easier for them to, to stay as hygienic as possible. I love that you've just busted that myth as well, because that is one key thing that, that people have said to us, oh, they're dirty. Of course. And they're not. They're, they're huge. I, I, they fly quite far to clean off as well, don't they? Yeah, the they do. some some studies show that they'll fly further yeah. to find water to bathe in than they will fly to find their meal in the first place. That's so again, we always, we always think of them as being all about food, all about getting in a carcass, all the rest of it. But actually, they're also about staying as hygienic as possible too. Yeah. Do you want to have a go? Oh, sure. Do you want to have a go flying him? I'm going to see whether he'll just... OK. <laughs> We're going to see if he'll just kind of take off again, yeah. do his own thing for a minute, and then we'll see whether he'll come and land on your glove, because he's, yeah. he's super friendly. Mm. Come he looks very friendly. Yeah, they're, they're sort of, uh, if people have got any concerns about vultures being, I don't know, kind of scary in any way, yeah. a hooded vulture is a great way to um, turn them round. If I turn you to there, he's going to come all the way in. Yes, very nice. <laughs> Good job. Well done. Excellent. Heavier than I was expecting. Yeah, he's um, it's almost two kilos, mm -hmm. so he's a sort of fairly chunky bird. Yeah. Um, but... I mean, there's no such thing as a small vulture, but in terms of Africa's vulture, he's one of the smallest. Yeah. You know, some of the larger vultures we work with, the white-backed and the uh, white-headed vulture, they are at least twice his size, maybe a bit more actually. Yeah. So vultures generally are big birds. And is there any legislation in place to help birds like Sundance here? <sighs> it's really difficult because the, the activities that's going on in terms of the poisoning of these birds on carcasses, yeah. that's all taking place as an illegal activity already. Yeah. So it's very difficult to tackle those issues through a legal framework because mm. that's kind of already been done. It's yeah. already illegal to go and poach an elephant for its ivory. So we kind of need a whole paradigm shift to, to have any impact on the cause. But what we're trying to do at the moment with such a small uh, a number of birds left with that endangered group of birds, critically endangered group of birds, is to try and firefight, you know, to try and save those last few birds so that yeah. we can kind of keep the species going and then they're not just going to disappear from our yeah. ecosystem. So, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a bigger problem than just vulture conservation. And we're here, obviously, to, um, to limit the damage that that's able to do. Yeah. And why is it so challenging to, to repopulate? What's the, the breeding habits of vultures? Yeah, I mean, we, we've very successfully this year, we've got had managed to hatch out two African white bat vultures yeah. and one hooded vulture, the first time we've ever been able to do that. So very we're all exciting. super excited. Yeah. Um, but you're right, it can be really difficult because vultures on the whole will only have one chick every year, which when you compare that to something like a barn owl, yeah. which in a good year might have six or even seven youngsters. Yeah. It's a very slow reproductive rate. Yeah, and also if hundreds can be taken out from one carcass, yes, it's yeah. just to replace them. It's just yeah, you know, yeah. So, so what? So the focus really for us with our living collection, so the the birds that live here on yeah. site with us, is to essentially secure the future of the species, be that in the wild yeah. or in human care in zoological organisations like us. Yeah. We want to make sure that our children and their children are still going to have vultures alive in the world with them even if the wild's no longer safe for them which i desperately hope that that's not going to happen yeah. but it's certainly a future we have to prepare for almost developing a bit of a an arc for these species yeah. through sort of worldwide breeding programs really which we're, we're a part of absolutely so tom what's your favorite vulture fact oh golly favorite vulture fact i guess is that they are inc incredible flyers i mean actually i might not say that who knows I think vultures are they're amazing for so many different reasons. These birds are fantastically efficient scavengers. So we reckon that 50 vultures can clear a 50 kilo impala carcass. So that's a little bit bigger than a sheep. Yep. In under 10 minutes. No. So 
that's a huge amount of food yeah. disappearing in a very short space of time. So, I mean, I must be frank, they've got no table manners, really. <laughs> but yeah. that is the level of efficiency. Yeah. You know, 50 kilos of meat disappearing in under 10 minutes yeah. with a relatively small group of vultures. We may find 200 vultures coming to feed on a, yeah. an animal of that size. So, uh, And how, yeah. how do they come about their pecking order? Or is it first come, first serve? It's a bit, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the hooded vulture here is as I mentioned, one of, the, one of the smaller species of vulture you can find. So they can't really decide to have a fight with what we kind of call the king of the savannah, which is the lappet face vulture, yep. big beefy vulture who will come in and just push other vultures out the way in order to get to the food. Yep. So there is a bit of a pecking order. And as a result, different species have kind of got almost different adaptations to their physiology. So you can see here with Fagin, uh, with uh, Sundance, sorry, yep. Fagin's one of his mates. <laughs> um, Sundance has got this incredibly kind of fine beak. Yep. So it's not like that classic jungle book vulture with a big bolt cropper for a bill. Yep. That's reserved for those larger species, the lappet face vultures, white-headed vultures, uh, a white back vulture. They're really there to tear into the, the meat. Yep. The hooded vulture is really there to pick up the pieces. Okay. Anything that's left behind on the carcass, anything that's right underneath the rib cage, that slender bill can reach inside and get to all the bits that nobody else could reach. Yeah. So they've almost evolved and adapted to know that they're probably just going to get the last scraps that are left yeah. and they can survive that way. So they have their own purpose at the carcass. They sort well, of do, yeah. Bad. They sort of have their own order yeah. and um, their own preferences as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, some, sometimes the bigger the bigger vultures are almost required to allow access for some of those other uh, smaller vultures. And in some cases, vultures require access by things like hyenas that need to break into that really tough hide of some of the larger carcasses, buffalo carcasses, things like that. Yeah. Wildebeest. So, um, <laughs> International Vulture Awareness Day yes. is on the 2nd of September. Mm -hmm. um, did... Hawk Conservancy Trust do anything to celebrate this year? Yeah, we absolutely did. I mean, it, like the Hawk Conservancy Trust was kind of one of the founders of International Vulture Amazing. Awareness Day, yep. which sort of makes sense. We make a big song and dance about vultures yep. every day of the year. But International Vulture Awareness Day is a, a big deal in our calendar, really. Yep. Uh, we had a few extra activities. So we had a special trail all about our Egyptian vultures mm -hmm. and how they migrate across the world. Um, we gave a little bit more information about one of our brand new projects with uh, another African species of vulture the lappet face vulture and uh, we did as much as we could to disseminate as much positive energy about vultures as possible every yeah. display had vultures in it somewhere and we even had some gate crashing vultures in our owl show as well Amazing. so yeah yeah one so of our like american a species takeover. Oh, it was yeah. yeah yeah and they have to they have to have their moment in the limelight they yeah. miss out on it so often yeah it's only fair they get a day all to themselves oh, i know it? i mean everyone looks at owls and they go oh they're really cute aren't they yeah and then yeah. they uh, and uh, you know i'm in all of the work that you guys do here because the promotion of vultures and their importance and the conservation of them it's just you know it's it's so front and center here it's it mm. yeah it, i'm in awe but do you find days like that for raising awareness do you find them really helpful oh for sure yeah yeah, yeah because it has a kind of a wider reach <laughs> i mean sometimes people who are coming to see us on that day know full well that it's going to be International Vulture Awareness Day and that's why they yeah. come because they want to come and celebrate them with us. Yeah. Often people are just visiting on the off chance and are suddenly thrown into this world of vultures and we end up with more fans of yeah. converted lovers of vultures so that can only be a positive thing. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Thank you so much to uh, Sundance for coming out oh, and welcome. seeing yeah. us. He's very um, pleased. He's got an extra little bit of food there. So yeah, just the way an to his amazing, <laughs> amazing bird. You do so much for conservation and they probably don't even know it. No, exactly. And yeah, you're absolutely right. The, uh, they are the ambassadors for their wild counterparts. You know, how many of us are ever going to have the opportunity to go and watch hooded vultures on the savannas of Africa yeah, actually here? You can come and do that every you day. You can make it which, a reality. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I mean, the shows are so much fun. Yeah. So much fun. And you get up close and personal. But do you know what? I've learned so much while I've been here. And I didn't come because I thought, oh, it'd be educational. Yes. Brought the family along. just, And it's such a lovely day out. Well, I think some of the best education happens when you don't realise you're learning. Yeah.
Yeah, you know, if you're having a really good time, yeah. you're just enjoying watching the birds fly, you know, even better if the weather's good, but even if it's not, yeah. you're in that close proximity with these incredible birds. And if you're having fun, then you're going to be picking yeah. up on some of that information too. And I've bought everyone from kids to, um, my, you know, nans and stuff. Really? And, yeah, yeah. And ev everyone takes something away. Mm. So for me, it really is something for everyone here. Uh, and I learn something new every time I come here. That's good. So, but yeah, I think we'll pop back into the studio Let's and then that. carry on talking about some other birds of prey. Fantastic. So we've just come in from seeing the amazing hooded vulture Sundance. But if we wanted to talk about birds of prey in more general in the UK, how many, how many species are there in the UK, do you think? There's 20 species in the UK, including the five native species of owls that we've got. Okay. What are the five species of owls, though? So we've got the tawny owl. <laughs> yep. So our most common native species. Yep. Little owl, our smallest native species. So we've got those two That's easy ones out of the way. Yeah. Yep. Barn owl, which we already talked about, the beautiful, beautiful quarter in flight, the one you're most likely to see. And then the long-eared owl and the short-eared owl. So known by those names because they've got little tufty feathers on the top of their head. Short-eared owls are shorter than the long-eared owls ones. So yeah. Sort of named very aptly lovely so you talked about owls there but there's a range of birds of prey we talked about some of them earlier you've got the buzzard uh, red kite yeah what are some of the other ones so we've got a peregrine falcon the kestrel as well the one that you'll see hovering over busy roads sometimes or over open countryside mm -hmm. hobbies which are sort of semi-migratory species that we'll only really see regularly during the summer uh, we've got harriers as well so quite a range of different species and I guess the most impressive are the two eagles that we have native to the UK, which is the We've golden got eagles eagle. In the UK. Oh yes, golden okay. eagles and uh, white-tailed eagles, which you know even in the south of England now you can see thanks to a, a reintroduction program of that species. So that's our UK's largest species of bird of prey, sometimes nicknamed the flying barn door because they've got this huge two-meter wingspan yeah. uh, and just kind of soar around, and, and they are really. The, the masters of the sky, I suppose. They yeah. just dominate the sky. Have you ever seen one in the world? I haven't, no. Oh. Do you know what's really frustrating is when we had first lockdown, which seems like a long, long time ago, yeah. um, we obviously didn't have any visitors here on the park, but on one of those days, we did have a wild white-tailed eagle really? flying about 100 feet or so above one of our arenas here at the Trust. Yeah, one of our, where all the benches are, people watch the displays. And uh, yeah, I wasn't here that day and I'm not at all bitter about it. Oh, do you often <laughs> get wild birds to coming in? Yeah, very regularly. Yeah, I mean, we're very pleased to say that the red kite was one of the species that we had a, a part to play in their reintroduction uh, to the UK. So they were down to really very worryingly low numbers, practically extinct in the UK. And then, uh, then part of a re-release program in the early 2000s. And now we see them very regularly on, in our little part of the world. So most common ones are red kites, buzzards uh, and strangely or maybe surprisingly peregrine falcons as well are fairly okay. common to see in these skies um, not too far away in Andover in town centre there yep. on top of one of the churches there's been a, a pair of peregrines roosting and, and breeding over the last few years so they sometimes pop across and say hello in the afternoon yep. which is great. Coolest fact about those? I mean the, the peregrine falcons it's the world's fastest living creature you yep. know they can't get cooler than that can you? Everyone thinks a cheetah is quick yep. you know 60 odd mile an hour. Peregrine flies a spots off a cheetah, like yeah. over 200 miles an hour in a dive. Um, so crazy. not so much flying, but falling yeah. with style at that and point. And they live in the UK. Said. They do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually sort of live right across the world, really. They've conquered pretty much every part of the world you can imagine. They don't live in Antarctica, but they live practically everywhere else. Yeah. And so they've just evolved and adapted to lots of different environments. And But the, the common theme is that speed. You know, they yeah. get up really high tuck their wings in and, and just dive towards their prey and, and hit their prey like a ton of bricks. It's yeah. that impact that's really, uh, really does the damage for their prey. Yeah. So being wild birds, you've got a, a hospital on site here at the Trust. Can you tell us a bit more about why is a hospital even needed for, for wild birds? That might be a really daft question. Yeah, well, I mean, wildlife faces all sorts of problems. You know, living in a living collection like ours, the birds that live here have a relatively speaking very easy life. You know, there's mm. food on tap. If they get unwell or poorly, we can look after them. They go and see a specialist vet. You know, they've got shelter at all times, somewhere safe to be away from predators. And that's just not the case for wild animals and, and wild birds of prey are no different. So they, they get into trouble. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, they, they just don't 
manage to pass the test of life, which is finding enough food to eat. Mm -hmm. You've got to have more energy coming in than you've got going out. And sometimes that doesn't happen. So we get birds come in that are malnourished. Mm -hmm. Often those are juvenile birds who are still sort of learning the ropes of life. Um, sometimes they've just been unlucky. They've been in the wrong place at the wrong time and they've been hurt by another wild predator. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sometimes we get issues where there's been conflict with human beings as well. So there's, there's all sorts of threats that face birds of prey. And sometimes we can help by providing that rehabilitation. Yeah. And um, how dangerous is it for you guys to work with wild birds of prey? I mean, I probably think there's incidents with the resident ones, but yeah, yeah. how dangerous is it? I mean, like any animal, any wild animal, there is an inherent element of risk. I mean, the different species that we have come into us, they, they all seem to have slightly different characters. So we know how to interact with those birds to try to keep their stress levels down. I mean, that, that's always the reason why an animal is going to feel like it needs to be dangerous in any way is if they feel threatened mm. in some way. And obviously the, the team that work in the hospital, they know very, very well how to interact with and how to handle those animals. Yeah. And so, yeah, they're, they're certainly not dangerous in, in the sense that it's dangerous for our staff to be working with those birds, but mm. we take precautions. We wear gloves. They've got big, powerful talons very often. Um, and, and so we wear, wear gloves for that. Um, and just keeping an eye on where the dangerous bits of the bird are, <laughs> which of course, very sharp beak, yes. very powerful talons and, and being respectful of that. Yeah. And what are some of the most common things that you'll see birds come in for? You you touched on the the malnourished. Mm. What other what other incidents bring birds into the hospital in the past? I suppose the most common patients we have come into the hospital, strangely, are perfectly healthy, and okay. they are the tawny owls. So we have in the region of about 150 to 200 individual birds being brought into the hospital in a normal year, yeah. and quite a large chunk of those birds are tawny owls. And they're what we call a very precocious species as a young young bird. So mm -hmm. they jump out of the nest much younger than you might expect. Okay. And they go through a process, process called branching. So they hop around the branches around their uh, natal site, around the, mm -hmm. the nest, and they jump from one branch to the next to the next. And invariably they try to jump a little bit too far they can't fly yet, they don't have their flight feathers, and so they fall to the woodland floor, which sounds dreadful, but actually they're really light, yeah. they're very fluffy, and so generally they sort of just bounce. Okay. Um, and so they're, they're usually perfectly healthy. Um, and very often, um, very well-meaning people will go on a walk through the woodland, see a baby tawny owl, a, a chick, having fallen out of the nest, and think, oh my goodness, it looks totally unprepared for life, mm. the parents are nowhere to be seen, I'd best pick this animal up and, and, and bring it into somewhere like us. Um, ordinarily, the best thing to do in that circumstance is to leave the bird where it is because they're pretty good at, at looking after themselves. They'll stay hidden away from predators where they can. Mm -hmm. They've got really strong feet and beaks from a very early um, period of their lives and they can use them as climbing hooks to get yeah. back up into the nest. And even if you can't see them, their parents will be around somewhere. They're yeah. very protective birds but they're also smart. They know if there's a human being around not to be flying around in the trees above their head because whether we like it or not, we're predators too. We've got yeah. big forward facing eyes and so they'll feel threatened by us. So to protect that nest and the other youngsters, they often won't be around when there's a potential threat. Mm. But throughout the evening when it's quiet, the parents will continue to feed. So although we get brought a lot of tawny owls, in some years it's been 40 birds or more. Crikey. Uh, sometimes the best thing to do is to leave them where it is. I mean, we'd always advise people to give us a call for advice yeah. if it's needed, but usually leave them well alone. Um, but what's really important is that those birds, because they're healthy, go back to the wild. Yes. But as they're too young to hunt for themselves, we've got to do a little bit of that parenting for yeah. them before they go out into the wild. The key feature of that is to not let them imprint on human beings, meaning we don't want the chicks to see us as other tawny owls. We don't want yeah. them to think that they're little human beings because mm -hmm. when they go out into the wild, that's going to cause them a whole world of problems. Yeah. So, uh, or so, you're a big owl. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you can imagine the newspapers, can't you, of, you know, an owl interrupt somebody's picnic in the woods. Yeah. Not because they're trying to attack anybody or be yeah. vicious in any way, but actually they just think, oh, people are there. I've always been fed by Friend. people, so I'll yeah. go and say hello. Um, so one of the key things that we do is to, to feed those owls 
so that they can't see us as human beings. So um, Cedric, who's our hospital manager, he has an owl glove puppet, essentially, <laughs> with a little pair of tweezers mm -hmm. where the beak should be. Yeah. And he'll feed the chicks with the owl glove puppet. So it doesn't look identical to an owl, but it looks a lot more owl-like than Cedric does. Yeah. And then when they're old enough, they'll go into an aviary with other tawny owl chicks usually. Okay. And they kind of get to know who they are, what they are, how they fit into the world. And then when they're fully flighted, they can be re-released back to where they were found. So, yeah. and, and ordinarily that's a really positive story. So as part of that then, do, would they then understand how to go and hunt naturally? Is it not, it's not then something that the parents have shown them, it's, it's built into them? Yeah, it's, it's almost instinctive. When okay. you think those chicks are going to be leaving the nest at a much earlier age and stage in their life than... Most people would expect, I think, you know, really at just a few months old, they're going to be out and hunting and catching their own food. So Amazing. the parents haven't got a great deal of time to teach them anything. Yep. Vastly, it's, it's, it's done on uh, instinctive behavior. They just want to go and catch their, their food, which for that species is largely rodents. Yep. And you touch on Cedric, who, who manages the hospital, but can trainee vets or those interested in gaining work experience with birds of prey volunteer here at the Trust? Yeah, absolutely. We, we cater for vet students um, sort of right throughout the year. We have several vet students join us. Mm -hmm. um, and the really nice thing about that is if they're here during a period of time where we're expecting our specialist vet to visit on site as well as part of their routine rounds, they can kind of oversee what's happening with the vet as well. So they're kind of seeing somebody else actively involved in treating exotic animals for all sorts of different reasons, but then also getting hands on with our collection too, because yes, the hospital is was set up to treat wild birds, mm -hmm. but that expertise that we've gathered from treating wild birds is often very valuable for looking after our birds within our collection too. Mm -hmm. So they can kind of get hands on with some of the routine care that the hospital kind of covers when it comes to the birds we, we work hands on with. Um, so absolutely. And we, we've got a, a huge range of volunteers that help us here at the Trust and, and we could not operate as well as we do without the fantastic team of volunteers we have. Yep. And some of those specialize in working with Cedric in the hospital. So yeah, absolutely. Volunteers are a real big help to us. Yep. So which of the British birds of prey are most at risk? Well, like with, unfortunately, with all wildlife in the UK, there's almost no animal in the UK that isn't at risk mm. for, for some reason, yeah. largely down to our changing climate or just a, a huge loss of biodiversity in terms of insect life. And, you know, the whole food chain as it, as it goes along obviously has a big impact on birds of prey too. Yeah. Um, at the moment, we're focusing on some key species. So we talked a little bit about the red kite. So re-releasing those birds um, just the other side of Reggie's Meadow at the top of our grounds yeah. into the Cholton Valley. And now we see those birds out in the wild. But that project hasn't stopped. That has continued in terms of monitoring the numbers of birds, monitoring their behavior, understanding how the population changes year to year, mm. understanding their threats. Um, buzzards, very similarly, we're, we're doing similar studies with to try and understand their population. Um, and then there are four key species that we look after as part of our uh, raptor nest box project. Okay. So putting up nest boxes for these birds is very helpful. Nesting sites for cavity nesting species, so anything that wants to nest in a nook or a cranny mm -hmm. or a hole in an old dead tree, those nesting sites are becoming few and far between. Yeah. So the four species we look after with that are three owl species, little owls, barn owls, and tawny owls, yep. and the kestrel. So all species that would like to nest in a very similar environment, a, a small gap somewhere that they can find. Um, now, clearly, some of those birds have adapted to finding alternative nesting opportunities anyway. The barn owl is a great example. Just think of its name. You yep. know, it's a barn owl. It, barn owls have been around a lot longer than barns have, but they've moved in to our old buildings, old yep. farm buildings. But even when those buildings are getting boarded up or they're being, you know, an old uh, barn is being converted into somebody's home, it's becoming harder and harder for them to find nesting opportunities. Mm -hmm. So us putting up those nest boxes is really, really helpful. Um, we started that project in uh, 2008 uh, with, I think, 35 nest boxes. 
and we've now got over 1,200 boxes, you know, across our study area. So it's, it's a fairly big project. Now, that's an amazing progress. Yeah, right? yeah. For and sure. is that just local to the trust here or have you got them across the yeah, UK? Right across the south of England. Yeah. Okay. So Hampshire and the surrounding counties, essentially. Um, so, yeah, it's a it's a it's a big job to keep an eye on the, all those nest mm. boxes. Um, Dr. Matt Stevens is our UK conservation biologist. She's a very grand title, <laughs> but he spends a lot of his time out in the field. We don't get to see him a lot on site at the trust because yeah. he is out watching nest boxes, monitoring parents raising youngsters, um, fitting uh, rings to youngsters' legs as well so they can be monitored later in life. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, the nest boxes are a big part of, yeah. of his job. So it's not just literally we'll put a few boxes up and, and we've provided some homes. It's everything else that goes with it. Yeah, for sure. Our responsibility continues beyond just putting the box up. Yeah. But also for, for our own means because we want to know how successful that's been, mm. be it the positioning of the nest box, uh, the location of the nest box in what sort of locality, what sort of habitat is around that area, you know, uh, how what the weather's been doing that year. All of that information is really helpful so that we can best place nest boxes in the future. So we want to monitor them for all sorts of reasons, but but partly so that we can do better as, as we go forward. Yeah. And it's a great project. And going from so few to over a thousand now yeah. is just phenomenal progress. So I know that you've got a really special award here, the Marion Pavier Award. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about that and what it is? So Marion Pavier was our first chairman yep. here at the Hawke Conservancy Trust, and she was a driving force behind uh, sort of establishing a lot of the conservation and research work that we do. So uh, Marion, sort of Marion's memory now, as she sadly passed away earlier this year, um, lives on through the Marion Pavier Award, which is... Uh, an award of uh, a small amount of funding to go towards up and coming conservation projects that directly link to birds of prey. So we've had uh, barn owls on vineyards in Florida. We've had people studying striated caracaras on the Falklands. Wow. Um, and uh, it's, it's so wide reaching. Yeah. Anyone who's involved in bird of prey conservation could apply. And it's, it's really interesting to me as a member of the bird team to see people on the ground working with some of the species that we work with day to day yeah. and hearing a little bit more about the, you know, the brand new conservation work that's happening with them is, is amazing. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, we're gathering some really vital data through doing that work too. Yeah. And I suppose you learn something new every day with things like that. Yeah. So understanding the differences of the birds that you're working with here, but then what are they observing in the wild? Mm. How is that behavior changing? Yeah. And it changes, sometimes changes the way that we then work with our birds on the flying team. You right. know, so great example of that is um, that work that was being done with the, the striated caracaras on the mm -hmm. Falklands. We know just really by working with them, that they are an intelligent birds of prey. They're very quirky. They they enjoy interacting with novel things. Yeah. And so one of the things we do for our on-site living collection is something we call enrichment. So mm -hmm. offering them something else in the day to keep them busy, keep them occupied. Sometimes it's a different way of feeding. Sometimes it's giving them something that smells a bit different if it's a species that uses smell to find food in the wild. But with these striated caracaras, even in the wild, they're being given things like uh, puzzle toys and puzzle boxes. And a lot of birds of prey wouldn't be interested in that. But those wild birds, they are. They're interested in playing with things and moving latches and pulling ropes, and yeah. especially if it offers them a food reward for doing it. Um, so that's kind of inspired some of the work that a few of my colleagues has been, have been doing with the striated caracaras that live here. Um, and we recently did an episode on, on our podcast yep. all about striated caracaras. And uh, Owen, my colleague who heads up one of the sections here at the Trust, um, he has Sirius, our striated caracara, on his section. And uh, we sort of challenged him to, to work out the puzzle feeder that Owen had presented him with. And he just went all guns blazing, just really wanted to interact with this brand new novel item in his aviary. Yeah. And, and that's really come from watching what some of that wild research has, has found out. Um, the research was also trying to study how these birds move around that relatively restricted range in the Southwest yeah. Atlantic. We know that when a bird is in a very small environment like that, very small habitat, if anything happens or changes in that habitat, a whole species can disappear. Yep. Um, so the more we understand how they move, how they interact with each other and just how they behave, the better chance we've got of supporting them in the future if something you know untoward does happen. Yeah. 
So you've had some great projects come through then as part of this award. Yes. If um, if somebody wanted to apply for it, they don't obviously have to have a UK project. You've just said it's worldwide. Yeah. But how do they how do they go about doing that? Well, it comes around every year. Mm -hmm. So really looking out for it on our social media channels and on our website. And then it, yeah, it's just an application process talking about what the project outcomes are likely to be you know roughly what you'd spend the funding on because we kind of want to know where that money is going to be ending up um but yeah i mean anybody anybody can apply for that that funding and it kind of goes through a sifting process through our conservation and research team yeah. and and we kind of pick the one that we we think is most most deserving of that funding amazing so just uh Coming towards the end now, Tom, because I know I honestly I could sit here for weeks and talk to you oh, and good. really geek out on some of these <laughs> birds of prey facts. We have a bird nerd. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but let's let's uh, take our listeners on a little bit of a journey. What's one of your funniest stories that you've had here oh, at the trust? They've got to provide you with some hugely comical moments. Yeah, they cause, do. Because birds have got their own personalities. They don't do uh, what you want them to do all of the time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so one of the things in, in my history working with Sage, my tawny owl, yeah. um, is that for a little while she came with me to a, a, another project that I was working on. And she was very, very keen to go and explore just, just as the... Uh, just as I mentioned with those wild birds hopping yep. around in the nest, she was she was much the same. So I'd kind of leave her for a few minutes at a time and come back and check on her. And she couldn't fly, so I didn't really think she could really get very far. Yep. And uh, it sort of took one of my colleagues to, to let me know that she was halfway down the past. Looked like she was going to go and buy herself an ice cream <laughs> <laughs> just, just halfway through the park <laughs> that we were working in at the time. So, yeah, I mean, they, they present us with all sorts of different challenges. Um, you know, sometimes the displays don't quite go to, to plan. Yeah. Um, we've had birds travel long distances and we need to go and go and find them. Yeah. Um, just last year, a bird called Chaucer, he's a Lana falcon, ended up doing what Lana falcons do best, which is to thermal. Yeah. So, so riding warm currents of air that kind of spiral upwards on a very warm August day last year. He flew from here in Andover all the way to the other side of Basingstoke where oh, we need to go and pick him up. And the great <laughs> thing is we're using technology now that allows us to, yeah. to track our birds, similar to the technology that's being used to track birds in the wild. And we weren't really that worried because we could see him on Google Maps yeah. and go, oh, look, he's sat on that lady's house over there. <laughs> and so thankfully, you know, they're very understanding and say, I'm really sorry. Can I go and go in your garden and pick up our falcon, please? <laughs> I love it because I've been at some of the shows here because, uh, as I said, we're, we're frequent visitors of the trust here. And I've been at the shows where one of the birds has just disappeared for a while. Yeah. And uh, it was an eagle that decided it was a lovely warm day and just went down to the river. Yeah, why not? Uh, to go and I have mean, a, a I mean, little bay. I guess that's part of the joy, isn't it? You know, when when we let the when we have the birds out and flying, yeah, it's their time to do what they want to do. Yeah, and sometimes that goes to the script, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it it all goes well. And sometimes they've got other ideas of how they'd like the display to go. Yeah, um, and and it's part of the fun, you know, yeah. it's part of the joy of of watching them just take to the skies and do their own thing. And as long as we've got all the birds. Back at the end of the day, yeah. what happens in between, you know, it's it's anyone's guess. <laughs> and that's the magic of this place because the birds literally do what they want to do. Yeah, and the birds are the stars. You yeah. know, we're, we're there to facilitate them yep. to make their lives as, as positive as they can possibly yep. be and to show people the best of birds of prey. Yep. And to do that, sometimes the best thing to do is to be hands off and just let them fly. Just let's watch what their natural behavior is. Yeah. Um, and so when we're developing our displays, we're always trying to tease out, okay, what is it about this bird that if you saw them in the wild, that is what you'd want to see? You yeah. know, so we've got a fantastic bird here called a secretary bird. You know, it's the tallest bird of prey in the world. They look almost like a, a cross between an eagle and a heron. You know, yeah. they're, they're kind of bizarre looking, but beautiful. Um, but they're very well known. A very small percentage of their diet in the wild is is venomous snakes. Mm -hmm. And so they kick a snake really hard. Um, and some of our research has shown that it's up to five times their own body weight in force, a huge kick. But if you wanted to see a bird, if you want to see a secretary bird in the wild, I'd want to see it doing that because that sounds yeah. exciting. So let's try and facilitate that. And of course, it's a bird's choice every time. But every time he comes out and spots the rubber snake, we offer him 
he gives it a good beating. You yeah. Know? <laughs> so I mean, it's I've interesting been to watch. very, very fortunate that I have actually seen a secretary bird in the wild. Have you? Yeah. Oh, well, you've trumped me but on that one. not kicking anything. No. So, and I've been in the display here where the just the sound, and you can hear the sheer force of it. Mm. I mean... Uh, I'd never see that in the wild, but um, yeah, they were, they're just amazing. Yeah. My daughter's favorite bird is, is it, I think it's a lot of people's here. favorite. Yeah, yeah, we often get asked about that bird, you know, when, whenever he goes out on our social media channels. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's pretty much, well, one of the birds that has gone viral on TikTok for us. You know, it's yeah. just, I think it's just because they're so striking if you'll pardon the pun yep um they're so beautiful as a bird yes. and so different looking and they behave so unexpectedly that um people can't quite believe they're real i've yeah. had people say oh it looks like a creature from you know harry potter or you know they just oh, no, look so different absolutely fascinating. and each of the birds have their own thing you know yeah. they're, they're obviously all adapted to living in a different environment or to catch different prey and we're, we're just trying to bring that to life and and we just facilitate that for the birds you know yeah. So on the flip side of all the fun that you have, and I know that you love your job, what are the biggest challenges that you face here at the Trust? I think one of the biggest challenges is is gaining the support for the work that we do. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the whole point of us having a visitor center here is to, yes, educate people. Yes, uh, give people a, an opportunity to see things that they'd never, maybe never get a chance to see in the wild. Yeah. Uh, but also we want to gather support for species, which is, you know, part of the reason we're very grateful for people like yourselves shining a light on birds like vultures. Um, it can be very difficult to persuade people into, you know, loving loving birds like vultures because mm -hmm. they have, you know, pretty much bad press all throughout history yeah. and uh, and they don't look quite so beautiful as an owl or a, a, as striking as an eagle or a secretary bird yeah. or whatever. So uh, sometimes that can be, be very, very tricky. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a really enjoyable job that we have. I mean, we we always say we have the best job in the world, but obviously that doesn't necessarily make it an easy job. You know, mm -hmm. the anyone who knows anyone who works with animals will know that it's long hours in all weathers, and you're working with, you know, in our case, over a hundred very changeable animals from day to day. So there can be challenges in in many different ways, and I guess one of the biggest challenges is working with live animals there's every chance that you know you're going to live to see some of those birds pass away and yeah. we, we build up such close bonds with these birds you know they are part of our family yeah. and so when when we have a loss on the team that's that's really really felt yeah. um only very recently uh, another vulture called dolores i know She's i a, met dolores. did you yeah. yeah and i think she has a she must have thousands of adoring fans yeah. out there. Oh. She's a beautiful scenarius vulture, yeah. sometimes known as a European black vulture. Quite a large bird, um, but had quite a difficult start in life, but didn't let it keep her down. You know, no, she, she was, was the sassiest one around, right? Sassy is yeah. the word, absolutely. And she'd be a bird that would come to the front of the aviary, interact with visitors. She'd do this lovely sort of head turning from side to side. That's how she'd say hello. Yeah. And for a lot of my colleagues, for sure, She's a bird that had always been here for, mm. for many, many years. And so they developed this close working relationship. And it's it's crushing when, mm. you know, they get to a point where, you know, sadly they're, they're no longer with us. So yeah. that, that is tough. But, you know, we have the joy of working with them while, whilst they're here with us. Yeah. And they, of course, live much longer lives with us than they would likely do in the wild, you know, because living here is so much easier than living in the wild. Yeah. And I suppose you need to balance that with the amazing breeding program that mm. you have here as well. So you do see that whole circle of life. But, you know, we talked about earlier the, the vulture chicks and yeah. the first hooded vulture this year for the yeah. trust. I mean, you cannot believe the reaction that the bird team had to that on the, on the day that we knew that that chick had hatched out. Yep. Uh, he's actually on Cedric's team. So he's in a... a secluded part of the ground so hooded vulture needs a little bit of quiet whilst yeah. they're breeding uh, or so we've found and uh, that is uh, just in an aviary off show to the to the visitor mm -hmm. but uh, on Cedric's section on the hospital yeah. and uh, on the day that he'd completed a marathon run the London Marathon run <laughs> in aid of the Hawk Conservancy Trust yeah. um, he also received the news of of this baby vulture the first hooded vulture ever to hatch out of the Hawk Conservancy yeah. Trust 
happened on the same day. I mean, how elated, would, yeah, how elated with your food? All the endorphins of the marathon. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you're exhausted, but also really good news. And among the bird team, we've just been jumping for joy. So we can't wait to, you know, to see how that bird develops as, as they get older. And have they got a name? No, it's actually part of the naming process at the moment. One of the difficulties is it's very difficult to know whether a bird is male or female until okay. they get a little bit older sometimes. Sometimes you can see the size difference. Mm -hmm. Females are often that little bit bigger than the males. Yep. Um, but with some of the vultures that are going into a breeding program, sometimes we need to send a, a feather away for DNA testing. It's that difficult to tell wow. the difference between males and females. So naming can sometimes be a bit of a tricky business. <laughs> and we've been known to get it wrong from time to time um, and, uh, and end up with a... You know, a male secretary bird called Madeline, but you know, it's it seems to seem to stick, and it's okay. So we had a public vote as to what the name of the hooded vulture should be. Exciting! And Matilda was the winner, so we got Matilda the hooded vulture. Amazing! So, as I've said numerous times, I've I've visited the trust uh, time and time again. I'm inspired what you guys do here, but how can the public really get involved if if they're inspired by what we're talking about or your own podcast or they've seen something in the news? How can they really get behind the conservation efforts that you have here at the Trust? There's all sorts of different ways. I mean, one of the key ways is to look after the little slice of wildlife that they might have in their own back gardens. Mm -hmm. So not everybody has a garden, but even if you've got a, a window box, something like that, planting wildflowers, attracting pollinators, everybody doing our own little bit. You know, you can imagine the the huge number of acres of land that between us we've all got in our own yeah. back and front garden. So, you know, looking after your own little patch, letting it grow a little bit wild, all of that sort of stuff can really, really support wildlife in general, which then goes on to support birds of prey. Yep. Um, of course, coming to visit us here at the Trust, mm -hmm. you know, that the funding that we receive from that, getting involved in some of the, the special days that we have, like yeah. International Vulture Awareness Day, all of that sort of stuff really, really helps to support us, which obviously then goes on to support our yeah. conservation and research projects. And you just mentioned events there as well. Mm. I visited last year, but your Winter Woodland Light Walk. Yes. That's an amazing evening event that people can get involved in. Yeah, it's in. incredible. It's a really special event. And we've we've done it twice before. So this January will be the, th the third time round. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be a little different this year. But the, the sort of two elements of the event are being able to see our grounds lit up beautifully. And we're, we're very lucky here because we've got largely um, uh, deciduous woodland and it, it's gorgeous when it's lit up. Even in the winter, mm -hmm. you've got those, you know, long kind of gnarled fingers of the branches reaching up into the night yeah. sky. Um, and so you can kind of explore that woodland. Um, and then the second part of the evening is, is kind of the finale, which is seeing our owls fly by the moonlight essentially, mm -hmm. but also we're able to use some some sort of special effects within the woodland as well to really bring alive natural light. Yeah. And that's what this year's theme is. It's all about the light that can naturally be found in the wild mm -hmm. and we can bring it alive in our woodland arena alongside our, our owls that will be skimming over the tops yeah. of people's heads, which is an amazing experience. It is an amazing experience. I've been for the last two since Have you you? Yeah, oh, great. So Excellent. Uh, yeah, they, it's... It is. It just transports you into a whole different world, mm. seeing the owls fly at night. It's yeah, it's different that, to in the daytime, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're kind of seeing them at their, their most comfortable, I suppose, because yeah. it's it's that natural time of, of flight for them. So, yeah, it's, it's yeah. incredible to watch. My only advice is just wrap up warm. So yeah, definitely buy a ticket. Cold and wrap in up January, warm. Yeah, yeah. Wrap up warm and, and buy a hot chocolate. Yeah, well, that's the lovely thing because you thing. can all snuggle up as a family <laughs> and then just have a lovely little Yeah, hot chocolate. and even a warm, fuzzy feeling that that hot chocolate money yep. that goes back into supporting those birds as well. Absolutely. So it all, all gives yeah. you that warm, fuzzy feeling in a roundabout way. <laughs> Love it. So, okay, so people can come visit you at the Trust. Yeah. What about fundraising events? Do, you, do people fundraise for the Trust? Yeah, sometimes people do. We've, we've had people do sponsored walks, sponsored swims. We've had uh, people... Uh, make artwork for us and go mm. on to sell that for us people you know uh, doing raffles we've had schools doing fundraisers for us yeah so yeah i mean every little really does help um i mean if people want to get involved in a very active way and and you like going out on walks in the countryside and you're within our study area 
we're often appealing for volunteers to help us monitor wild bird populations as Great. well. Those kestrels, the uh, the buzzards and, and red kites in particular. Mm. But having more boots on the ground, yeah. adding to that data set, you know, with a little bit of training, a little bit of know-how, you're able to actively get involved in some of the, the conservation work too. So, yeah, there's a, there's a whole spectrum of ways people can help. And uh, everybody doing their little bit is obviously going to going to help us to be able to achieve that mission of conserving birds of prey. Yeah. And how do people find out about that? Is that on your website? It is. Do yeah, they apply yeah. through? What's the website uh, address again? It's hawk-conservancy.org. Okay, fab. So if anyone wants to go in and find out more, just go and visit the website and you can apply yes, through there. Yes, that's right. As I said, I honestly, I could talk for days, weeks, years probably about right. the, the work that you guys do. But I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. So thank you so much for coming on a walk in the park with Animal Friends. It's been amazing talking to you. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and, and to introduce you to some of the birds as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you to all of our listeners. You can find out news about our podcast on our Instagram or TikTok handles, which is at Animal Friends Insurance, or on our Facebook page at Animal Friends Pet Insurance.